Thank you for tuning in. It's said in the Tibetan worldview that it takes crazy kind courage to be born on this planet in a human form because there's so much, so little certainty except for, as I said, taxes and death. It is very easy to be fearful and anxious and takes courage to smile at fear and even to make use of it. Today, again, I have such a person with me. She is in traditional shamanic cultures known as a dreamer someone who imagines and provides vision for a better future. She is, in fact, a futurist. Her working title for her PhD thesis at UH Manoa is Futures of Our Genetic Biocommons, Synthetic Biology, and Biodiversity in the Anthropocene. Miss Yi is a wee bit of a Renaissance woman, combining her brainiac qualities with being a noted artist and acclaimed businesswoman, the project design coach to the form of Midyar Fellows, and last and for sure not least, a mother of two beautiful children. Thank you, Ms. Yee, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. May I say Aubrey? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so after I read your three... Uh, <laughs> Three-page uh, resume. Uh, yeah. and all, all the things have you read. Academic resumes yeah, right. are longer than most. Right, and, yeah. uh, and, uh, and I had to look up so many things uh, to know what you had written about. <laughs> I said to myself, I want to ask her, what does she do with all her free time? Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah all that free time. I wish there was some. This is when you strangle me. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, okay, let's jump right in. Sure. What is a futurist? And I'm kind of curious, uh, just explain that but also do you see in pictures or do you think in conceptual how, how does that work upstairs That's upstairs between those two years gosh i don't know if yeah maybe in pictures i have to think about that a little bit more probably conceptually uh -huh. um, but a futurist really is someone who thinks about the futures and we always say futures with an s because the idea is that there are like limitless possibilities of alternative futures and also preferred futures mm -hmm. um, so it's really the study of the future you know, we all take a history class at some point in mm -hmm. our life, or many points in mm -hmm. our life. We don't study the future as rigorously as we study the past. And I think futurists believe that that's a mistake, that we can learn a lot by studying the future and actually be able to create the futures that we want more um, readily if we're actually focused on them. Why were you drawn to this? I mean, what, what, you're yeah. a little kid and you go, Mommy, I'm going <laughs> to be a futurist. And yeah. she says, don't let this happen, girl. No, totally. <laughs> I've always been into science fiction for sure. But it, um, it was sort of a, a series of events. So I was running my business, uh, Pacific Home at the time, and right. just had a gnawing feeling in my gut. I'd been doing the business for a while, really learned a ton, but just wasn't feeling fulfilled. Right. Wanted to do something more that was giving back and sort of helping to shape um, what I saw as a lot of issues that are affecting our planet. Um, so uh -huh. I started thinking I'd go back to school because I've always loved school looked at UH, enrolled as an unclassified graduate student, and started just checking out classes, took a few different courses that were interesting, stumbled upon this class called Politics of the Future, and I was like, what is that? That's uh -huh. bizarre. Yeah, yeah, looked yeah, at yeah. the syllabus, and yeah. half the books were ones that either I'd read or really wanted to read, uh -huh. and just all the ideas sounded pretty amazing. So I went to the class, and within uh, even before the class started, just the pre-reading for the first day uh -huh. of class, uh -huh. Give um, me an Jim Dater a had a, well, it wasn't even a book. It's just a short piece that he uh -huh. wrote called... Um, I think it's called the 10 qualities that a futurist needs, something like mm -hmm. that. But it's basically just very briefly, you know, uh -huh. the ability to think about a lot of different things, um, the ability to think creatively, an open mind, all, all these different qualities of a futurist that just really spoke to me. Yeah. So what I found in, in the Future Studies Center was yeah. activism meets intellectualism. Oh, yeah, and that there, really spoke to me were, because I didn't want to just be in the ivory tower. Like right. I wanted to actually right. do something. You wanted your some hands, you want some dirty yeah. fingernails, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Okay. So and, and, and the hopefulness of Futures is that we have the capacity to, sh to shift uh -huh. and um, ultimately create preferred futures. Okay. So that also spoke to me because, as you said, I'm a dreamer. Uh -huh. I'm definitely an idealist. Huh. Uh, struggling uh, these days, but. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. What's the problem? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine. Okay, it's 1778. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to say it's uh, Sir James Kurt, Starship Enterprise. Sure. But it's actually Sir James Cook. Uh huh. Arrives in the Hawaiian Islands. Oh. It would have been incredible. It's, uh, at that time, they said there's somewhere between 150,000 to estimates up to a million mm -hmm. Hawaiians living here sustainably, mm -hmm. obviously in the most isolated islands on the planet. They had a system of land sharing called Ahu Ahuwa. Ahu 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 yeah. And somehow they had made this thing work, that kind of division of from <coughs> upper valleys all the way to the ocean and everybody sharing in between, a sustainable life that still gave them time to surf. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that sound great? <laughs> now we're close to the same level of population, 
And it said that our food stores would last us exactly six days. If we're lucky, I think. Yeah. Six days Three if we're lucky. Three to five, probably. Okay. But <laughs> so um, speak to us a little bit about sustainability in Hawaii mm. and what you see coming down the pike. Yeah, I've been concerned. What's your dreams? What's your hopes? Yeah, hopes are that we become more um, self-sustaining and more uh -huh. uh, less consumptive in general. Uh, my big hope is that we move away from extractive industries. I think that's a huge issue is that we, we, we think in, of things in terms of single use. So how do we extract, use it once, and then throw it away? And that's just not going to last. Okay. We live on the most isolated islands on the planet. So importing everything is not sustainable either, and we've reached a point where we import almost everything. So I've been thinking about that issue for quite some time in food security. That's why I got involved with Kanu Hawaii, the organization that I've been in, involved with for a while, is just thinking about those things. How do we create more resilient communities right. um, that can withstand the shocks of uncertainty that we know are coming? Mm -hmm. We don't know what they're going to look like, but we know they're coming. So what are we doing to create a fabric that's going to hold us together rather mm -hmm. than tear us apart? So. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you put out a little video you have some fun stuff on uh, <laughs> if you search your name. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and one of them, I told you I kind of was kidding with you, that it kind of had a Mad Max feel to it. Uh -huh. I mean, there were some dire kind of predictions or outcomes that weren't very sure. comfortable to look at. Mm -hmm. I want you to talk a little bit about that and, again, um, both hopes and fears on that one. Sure. Yeah, so it's funny, we, um, in the future studies, sort of the Manoa futures method, there's lots of different methods, but uh, the one that's been pioneered by the Manoa School at UH, it's four different archetypes of the future, one of which is collapse. And for whatever reason, I've always been very, like, drawn to collapse, which seems strange, mm -hmm. but I think what draws me to it is, well, for one thing, it feels somewhat imminent in certain ways. Things are unraveling. Whether they fully collapse or not is a question, but there is definitely change afoot. But you know I also see that guy that did ger germs, guns, and steel. Yeah, yeah, he guns, germs, and steel. Jared Diamond. Diamond. Mm -hmm. He did the one on collapse and why why society yeah. collapsed. Mm -hmm. Remember reading that yep, one as for well. For sure. Yeah. So go ahead. Keep so, on. But, but the other piece is uh, the other side of collapse is a new beginning, right? So if you have something that falls apart, uh -huh. there's a vacuum created, which means that there's space to create something anew. So uh -huh. I actually see hope in that. So mm -hmm. while the collapse is frightening and there's some fear around like what that would be like and what it would look like, what I'm interested in is how do we start to create the things that would fill the vacuum in the void? Because if we're not actively constructing those potentialities, then when the space is there, something will fill it and it might not be the most positive thing. G uh, give some concrete examples. Um, Here in so Hawaii. For example, if we were to stop having ships come and bringing food, what mm -hmm. would fill that vacuum? How would okay. we, you know, how are we going to create a resilient economy around food security and those sorts of energy? Do you see people with vision uh, approaching these kind of questions? Definitely, yeah, definitely. And I think uh, in Hawaii, I mean, there's a whole Hawaii sustainability forum. I mean, totally. there's, uh, there's yeah, Mala Farms, what they're doing out there, Hawaii right. Center amazing for Food Safety. Amazing what they're there's doing out there. Totally Fun amazing. stuff. Really incredible. So those yeah. kind of visionary people mm -hmm. that we really have, I think, in abundance is a, a huge blessing. And a lot of that goes back to what you were saying about um, sort of ancient Hawaiian or you know traditional Hawaiian ways of right. land management and producing food and finding ways to bring those into the 21st century mm -hmm. in really put productive and positive ways. Because I feel like those systems build community rather than divide us because of the way they're constructed, the way the way that you grow food, say, like Ma'u Farms and what they've done with their internship program. Yeah. You're not just mm -hmm. growing food, you're growing mm -hmm. kids and you're growing community. That's so there's multiple said. levels mm -hmm. that it's it's working on versus, say, an uh, industrial agricultural system, which right. is really just about profit um, and being efficient. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, not, there's something missing there that I think we really need to mm -hmm. rethink as we mm -hmm. think about rebuilding different structures in society. Uh, back in the day, uh, I don't want to say what the day was. Well, it was 1972. <laughs> there was a book that was circulating. It wasn't a real comfortable book. Limits of, to growth? Uh, right. Yes. And uh, a Club of Rome. Yes. And uh, as a hippie back in those, not that I would have joined that club. <laughs> Stretch of the imagination. Uh, but back in the day, there were some really hard, hard facts circulating, particularly about peak oil consumption, mm -hmm. food consumption, food, uh, food uh, sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. There's different models that have been projected on that. Some saying that it was uh, not so not so accurate because mm -hmm. certain things came along. One being the computer, kind of sure. kind of nobody saw the, that yeah. one really coming. Yeah. Fracking, for instance, we yeah. didn't see this coming. There's certain things that, but really the question is: Is the glass half full in your world, or is the glass half empty in your world? But talk oh, about gosh. that. Oh gosh, I would say the glass is always half full, but I'm definitely struggling lately with. Um, I think just the trends I'm seeing in terms of the political divisiveness and sort of the rush towards greater environmental destruction that's happening in this particular moment is just disheartening in terms of its lack of compassion. 
um, and lack of empathy for not only the human world but also the non-human other. So that, that's a struggle for me lately that I don't think I felt as much or as keenly until you know, about the last year. You know, uh, that, that shifts into something that I'm very much looking forward to speaking about, which is values. <clears throat> it seems that um, if you value the next color TV or back in the day of how you inherit the new car, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. that you aren't going to have a sustainable long-term change in growth until you have a change of value. Yeah. So, for instance, you have the brilliance of the King of Bhutan saying, I don't measure gross national product, mm -hmm. I measure gross national happiness. Mm -hmm. So let's go into what is success and what is happiness. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you see that's going to cause a shift? Because I, I, what I'm saying, if you don't have a value shift, yeah. you're not going to be able to do this out of a should and could and would. Yeah. Even right now, we've got a pretty profound information system coming down that we've heated up our globe. Mm -hmm. Chicago didn't, Chicago didn't have any snow last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, this isn't... They're about to have a blizzard in yeah, March. Right, you think right? this is so, funny, but yeah. and here it is. So no. you, you may be a climate change denier. I don't know if that oh, gosh, works. No. Uh, uh -uh. But no, but some people may be. <laughs> some people may be, but... But nonetheless, until you value something different, until mm -hmm. society says, wait a minute, this next purchase really is not going to make me mm -hmm. happy, you yeah. still have what you called, what you call it, where you... Just take extractive, extractive economies, uh, yeah. economies. So let's talk about values. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I've been thinking about Happiness, that a success. lot lately. And what I, what I feel, um, what I've noticed is that we've really lost any sort of discussion of, of ethics. So especially like in schools, we moved so far, especially in America. We said, okay, <coughs> separation of church and state, we're not going to teach religion in schools. But we, we don't teach anything about ethics. So there's no, unless you're getting it from some other place in your life, there's nothing that connects you to the fact of what we have in common as humans. So all we're focused on is our differences. What's our different culture? How do we look different? How do we dress different? How do we I act different? I've got to push you on this one. What's the, what do you call an ethical education? Because, I mean, you know, you go back to Confucius and said it was a pillar of, of any educated sure. person. Yeah. You can even trace that to Rome. They're saying the same thing. I don't think we have that anymore. And what do you say? Is, what so do you call, it was a secular education. But we don't, okay, so if you look at all the religious traditions, they have certain things in common, you know, sort of compassion, care for the other, something mm -hmm. beyond yourself, mm -hmm. do unto others, you know, those sorts of uh, sort of, bedrocks of, of sort of an ethical way of living and seeing beyond mm -hmm. yourself that are pretty consistent no matter what background you come from but we don't teach any of that elucidate them again kindness kindness compassion empathy empathy mm -hmm. yep um doing unto other i mean I think that's empathy too mm -hmm. um what else would there be i mean it's you know sort of the but, but really a vision of the world that's other than me and mine and exactly me, mine and what do i get yeah. out of this yes. right yeah, mm -hmm. service, I think, is an, yeah. an ethic. Mm -hmm. that What's it, community? It, yeah, exactly. What makes you happy? Yeah. so there, there's Actually exploring happiness? Totally. Yeah. yeah. I, just, I just got turned on to this new movement that I hadn't heard about that um, it's a whole group of people who are creating a secular vi version of church. So oh, it's community yeah, yeah, gatherings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, heard yeah. about this? Yeah, I have. In California, I actually got sent all over the Really, 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 really fun. Yeah. Lot of You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, Citizen Journalism for Hawaii. Finding the intersection of our sense of place and our place in the world right here at home. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Aloha Kako. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to navigate the journey with us. We are here every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. And we really want you to be with us where we look at the options and choices of end-of-life care. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Richard Emery, host of Condo Insider. More than a third of Hawaii's population live in some form of association. And our show is all about educating board members and owners about their responsibilities and obligations and providing solutions for a great association. You can watch me live on Thursdays, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. each week. Aloha. Thank you again. All right, we were just talking about values, ethics, yes. small, small kind stuff. Small kind stuff, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so values. So yeah, I do think there needs to be a shift in values, um, from valuing objects to valuing relationships, yeah. valuing people, valuing you know, connection, all of those sorts of things. But we were talking about education no longer seeing that as part of their curriculum, no yeah, longer seeing this as an important thing. So people grow up with that means that the main influence is going to be consumerism and yep. uh, buying Consumption. stuff. Consumption. And, and happiness comes from bigger car, bigger mm -hmm. house. Da, yep. da, da. I mean, stuff that really, once you get privileged in life, you look back. But uh, there's a couple, of my, my mind goes in a couple of places on that one. Mm. One is is that your, your boss, uh, 
Mr. Midyar. Mm. I mean, he did a beautiful thing. He brought the Dalai Lama here. The Dalai Lama said this uh, has been saying that uh, empathy has to be taught in every school. Yes. It's the only chance we have. And then I'm thinking, oh, empathetic civilization by Ridkin mm -hmm. about the development of how empathy actually develops yep. the culture, et cetera, et cetera. So totally. kind of going in a lot of different directions. But yeah. now we do have uh, three or four schools teaching uh, the Dalai Lama's mm -hmm. uh, um, empathy classes. Yeah. One of them in our Kailua town. Oh, I didn't know that. Which yeah. school is that? The high school. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah so I've, I'm seeing more of it, definitely, which is great. Mm -hmm. But I do think that's something that we sort of lost along the way. So just been thinking about that a bit in terms of values and ethics. And how do we find ways to see our commonalities? Because we mm -hmm. spend so much time thinking about our differences. And I think that's really sort of ripping apart the fabric of, of our country at this point. Not yeah. the world. Wow. And then I, I'm thinking back of living abroad. I've had the privilege and uh, delight of living abroad. And the, the first time I world, uh, lived in a third world country, I was 20, uh, 20 years old. Mm. And uh, I was a little bit escaping the country mm -hmm. uh, uh, in terms of uh, the political climate at that time was extraordinarily uncomfortable. I didn't know what was going to come down. We had a guy named uh, Richard Nixon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and something about mm. Vietnam. Yeah. Anyway, there's a lot, a lot, of, a lot yeah. of things that were very mixed up in me as a human being. Sure. But the, the, coming to the chase of this question, I realized at that point there was no telling a poor Moroccan a uh, young lad that he didn't want a Honda. That, yeah. that really wasn't going to happen, yeah. nor that he, he didn't want a flat screen TV. Uh, yeah. So there was this kind of thing like, wow, okay, how do you actually do that? And I went back to America, which I, as soon as you set foot on this country, I'm just, oh, lucky live. Yeah. Lucky live America. Totally. Lucky live Hawaii. Yeah. But uh, these kind of different things kind of came together. I mean, right now, uh, we, the average American probably, there's a sense of entitlement that I'm just afraid yeah. that it, you don't mean to be critical. I love my country. I love this experiment. But we're using two times as much energy as the Japanese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're using uh, 16 times or something like that as an Indian and 370 times more energy than the average Ethiopian. Yeah. We're using six times more water on average than mm -hmm. anybody else in the globe. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying guilt, but I'm also saying there is a bit, of, it, there's a bit of, it, of, of density about our country. We don't really realize totally. how, how uh, extreme our energy and privilege is in mm -hmm. this country. Yeah. So what do you, again, we're back to values. What do you see changing there? Gosh, I mean, I wish it would change faster, <laughs> to be honest. I think there's pockets of people who are definitely shifting, you know, and, and you, so the way I try to stay um, up about it all is to focus on the pockets of people who are shifting, because mm -hmm. there really is still so much of a trend in the other direction um, and, the, and the level of entitlements and, and sense that we can just close off our borders and like, you know, wall ourselves in and that's going to make everything okay without realizing we're so interconnected that like we wouldn't even have all the material things we have without the interconnection but we want only we want only those parts and we don't want any of the fallout so right. I, I just I, I can understand that everybody wants a job of course and everybody wants a good life I can understand that but I remember now we we come from that period where the first picture of the entire globe was mm. put in front of us this mm -hmm. beautiful ornament this extraordinary yeah. uh, spaceship yep. sitting there in space and I what I didn't see a boundary on the whole place no. you couldn't know when you were in Canada it's all an or illusion. United States. you it's couldn't all an know illusion. when you were in Mexico we've created that illusion. okay so we created all these <laughs> things and said this is me this is mine let's protect it this is kind yeah. of a silly thing and yeah. now of course we don't have like uh, pollution I don't know it doesn't stop at boundaries yeah Global warming doesn't stop at boundaries, so yeah. we're being forced to look bigger than nationalistic. And now we have this. I hope I don't backlash. I, I don't want to be too strong mm. of a word, but something about this. Yeah, it's fear around it, like fear. Me and mine. Fear. It's sort of a sense of yeah. um, I've got to protect what I've yeah. got because yeah. other people are going to take yeah. it from me. Go on. And with I that. just, I, 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 in my perfect world, we'd have a collaborative form of governance. Like, what if we thought of every country and we're like, okay, we know we're different, and that's great. Like, the difference is actually a beautiful thing. So, like, what are we each good at, passionate about, as like identities, like our culture, and then how do we help each other rather than competing? Like, what if we thought about the world that way? You know, but we think about the world in the competitive terms of mm -hmm. I've got to, our country has to make sure we get what we need for our people, America first, mm -hmm. instead of thinking about it as like, what, what can we offer and what can we get back? How can we have a reciprocal relationship? But mm -hmm. we've, we've built all of our structures, again, upon the extractive economy that's mm -hmm. based on making sure that you take whatever you need to get what you can for yourself. Yeah. And whatever the fallout is for the other nation, that's their problem to deal with. I always told myself, so, I said, 
my, my job is to teach you how to be happy, and I promise you, if selfishness works, I would have really gotten in there. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't work. You don't get happy that way, my friend. You yeah, and it's definitely by, not half as fun. If you get like, happy by helping. Just, but, yeah. but let's go on to that, because that, uh, there's almost a spiral dynamic, Stephen sure. Beck's work. Mm. It's, um, the Nimes, or whatever he calls them, where he, he actually goes from uh, tribal cultures up to more sophisticated cultures, meaning that you start to learn about just what you spoke of, that actually sharing is the way to go on this thing, and mm -hmm. thinking holistically is the way to go. It doesn't put very many people at, I think it's turquoise is the top mm. thing, but do you see that kind of trend of cultures getting more empathetic, more kind? I don't see that trend, no. Oh. Unfortunately, I see, like I said, I um, see pockets. Uh -huh. So it doesn't mean that it's not happening. Mm -hmm. But I think. And you see certain industries or certain yeah. uh, corporations doing that. But I think even thinking along the lines of it being a nation is mm -hmm. maybe part of the problem because I think mm -hmm. the nation state as we know it is, is again a structure that's collapsing. Mm -hmm. It's one that we're holding on to really tightly this idea of borders and nation state. But it, it's only been around for a few hundred years. Like there's a very good chance that the whole idea of the nation state could be gone in the near future. You know, I mean, it's not to say that that's always going to be a static sort of entity and way of organizing ourselves on the planet. Right, 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 right. And again, I'm thinking of, um, um, in contrast, in touching back into the ethical, and now we're seeing mindfulness in schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually teaching pre people how to be present. Woohoo! What? Yeah, teaching people I know. how to they, be present? They teach that in my, my uh, son's preschool. Isn't it's awesome. That? They yeah. do quiet sitting and yeah, they do yoga. I've, I've, and it's, yeah, I've taught that myself yeah, at school. It's fantastic. So. But there's this whole thing, uh, I think it's Stephen Pickner, Harvard, Harvard mm. Pro, uh -huh. uh, <coughs> saying that actually also if you look back on 40 years, never have there been more people fed, never have there been sure. more people enjoying an extraordinary life on the, on the planet, yeah. less crime, less war, mm -hmm. less all kinds of things. So there's also this thing of looking at the human trend and going, whoa, you know, 200 yeah. years ago, literally, yeah. 300 years ago, there's mo many places you could not have walked as a, yeah. as a woman. True. Couldn't, couldn't have walked. Yep, I definitely. Mean, you, I so, don't forget that kind of so stuff. You, what, if, what also about the optimism of this thing, that mm. we're actually smarting up? We're yeah, getting, I mean, that's what I hope for. You know, and I hope that we're able mm -hmm. to use technology and, and be empathetic about how we um, create our societies. You know, I mean, that's the key. We have to think beyond ourselves. You know, I, I have to put a plug in. If, if you have 11 well-spent minutes, go uh, look up uh, empathetic civilization by uh -huh. Rigdon, the little cartoon one. Cool. It really is such a. Have you seen that one? No, I haven't. I, 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 empathetic civilization. What awesome. a upbeat kind of vision of where yeah. this could go. Yeah. Okay. So we need those visions, I think, for sure. Because again, we have right. to think of preferred futures if we ever want to get there. Yeah. Now you work for a pretty interesting individual, pretty mm -hmm. interesting man, mm -hmm. pretty interesting couple. Mm -hmm. They're doing fabulous work yeah. here in Hawaii. Absolutely. All around the world. Stupendous. Really. You're going to love yeah. it. It's great. <laughs> it's going to be huge. It's going to yeah. be huge. But all around the world. Beautiful. Really. Yeah, beautiful. totally. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a bit complicated. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you're with the Amid Your Fellows. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Go ahead. What are you doing there? Oh, gosh. It's such an amazing experiment. So really the idea, um, the whole theory behind the Amid Your Fellows program is that if we were to get some of the best and brightest emerging leaders in Hawaii mm -hmm. and empower them with as much learning as possible and a support network that's you know activated and um, collaborative, that they'll do amazing things. So there's mm -hmm. really no other agenda than that. Uh, whatever they choose to do is what they choose to do with it. But it's um, it's a pretty beautiful way of thinking about things. So, so you're trying to cultivate new leaders. Yeah, to support leaders that are, you know, people who are already proven to be some leaders in some way. Um, and one of our main criteria is, again, that they're leaders that think beyond themselves. So they're not just in it, you know, to rise their own rung on the ladder, but to actually help Hawaii for the future. Oh, beautiful. So. You know, your boss has had the delight of actually giving a billion dollars. I like, know, it's amazing. Oh, it's pretty pretty incredible. To, to give a yeah. billion. And what a huge uh, weight, too, yeah. I mean, at the same time to think about. Yeah. And so that's where the systems thinking um, work that I do with the fellows came in. Was we this, talked about that. Yeah, so right. it was basically, you know, looking at when you're giving out all this money, are you really affecting change? Right. Right. So really thinking deeply, and that's what's so amazing about the Omniers is they take the time to think deeply. About is, how is what we're doing actually helping? So right. it's not just about handing out the checks and hoping for the best. Yeah. They've really done a lot of deep thought, and that brought them to the systems thinking practice, which is really just a way of trying to understand complex social systems and how you create transformational change. And the communication itself forms a certain kind of outcome. Mm -hmm. 
yep. a certain way of organizing communication serves yep. a certain outcome. Definitely. The, the guy at the top who rants and raves serves a certain kind of outcome in a government, etc. Yep. Versus a guy who's collaborative and says, listen, this is going to be a messy deal, but we have to hear from everybody. Yes, exactly. It's okay. going to take longer, it's going to be messier, but mm, it's important. It, but it's important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you have a magic wand. <laughs> you can cure one disease. Oh. I have no idea. One disease. Yeah, one so disease. Many. Probably cancer. Cancer. Okay, okay you're gonna I have go to pick one kind of cancer. I guess <laughs> there's so no, no, many. no. You can go with cancer. <laughs> you can go with cancer. Uh, We've both been touched by that in our lives personally yeah. this last week, right? Yeah. Right. Okay, so cancer would be yours. Yeah. All right. Uh, lucky live Hawaii. Favorite Hawaiian word. My favorite Hawaiian word. Mm -hmm. Kuleana. <laughs> go ahead, go for it. Um, responsibility, a sense of, of connectedness. So it's that you're you, mm -hmm. part of your beingness on the planet mm -hmm. is your uh, gift of giving back. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I probably haven't touched on your uh, after school kids program mm. that you started with Brady. Mm -hmm. yeah. I haven't touched on Kanu, the yeah. your, uh, uh, head honcho with that. Is there, you want to add a few? Yeah, I'm on um, the board of Kanu and uh, helped mm -hmm. to start after school all stars. So. Yeah, I mean, Kano Hawaii is, is sort of going through a new renaissance right now, too. We mm -hmm. have a new executive director, Keone Kealoha, who's awesome. And really, again, trying to see, like, what... Th this organization was started as a social movement by James Koshiba and some 40 other amazing individuals mm -hmm. in about 2004. And the vision then was, like, how do we get people to come together and start to build community? Mm -hmm. That's what I really liked about the organization when I joined it. So we're, we're looking at how to do that, again, in new ways. Um, and then After School All Stars has been an incredible uh, gift to see how that just the spark of an idea could become something that's now serving you know thousands of kids across the state in after school programs oh, run thank by so Don Dunbar. She's amazing. So oh, <laughs> thank you so much yeah. for coming aboard, coming thank on, you. and spending some time. And I usually sign off here. I say, hey. Be kind, be courageous, do some good, and mostly have some fun. And that's <laughs> That's the wrap for Planet of the Courageous this week. Aloha, thank you for, so much for tuning in.